Hello, Walt Fearon here. Uh, I've been having a rather interesting conversation with a friend who, um, who's interested in studying martial arts, but she's not sure to get what kind she really wants to study. She just knows she would like to do something that uh, incorporates dual wielding, preferably short swords or daggers. And I told her about uh, Kali Eskrima, Filipino martial arts. Um, but I also kind of, I like them. They're okay. I think their training is a little bit flourishy. I've got uh, my own Kali stick here, Rattan Eskrima stick. And of course I've got my copious machete and I've got it uh, still in the scabbard, so I'm going to be using it to demonstrate some techniques with. Um, <laughs> before I do that though, um, I did used to train, I haven't done this in a while, so I'm going to be a little bit out of practice, but I did used to, to train some flourishes with uh, the, uh, the rattan stick here, so... So um, anyway, that's that's the kind of thing you get out, out of a screamer. I cannot do that with two weapons. Um, and furthermore, there there is a video on YouTube I actually showed with her uh, with Doug Markaida talking about the fact that you wouldn't do a lot of the same kind of flourishes with a sword as you would a stick because you could cut yourself. But um, I also just I I'm cautious around a sword. I respect them. I'm not an idiot. So um, one second. Um, um, so I, I don't ever do that with a sword because this thing is a hell of a lot heavier than this. And um, rattan wood is actually very fibrous, so you know, on impact, it hurts. Believe me, I could hurt somebody with this thing, but not as bad as this wood. Because the fiber will actually um, kind of deform and absorb some of the impact. Whereas with this thing, this is a piece of steel, and even in a scabbard, if I brought this down into somebody really hard, you know, I could break bone. I could, you know, break a jaw or something. But, um, but so I just kind of wanted to talk about dual wielding a little bit more, uh, demonstrate a little bit, and show a little bit of how maybe you could use some uh, more traditional medieval martial arts techniques out of HEMA could be applied to dual wielding. Um, a big proponent of what I I talk, I believe in when it comes to martial arts and what I'm trying to in, work into my own style, training instinct, is the concept of not being traditional, of taking traditional techniques. Now, traditionalism is fine. I'm very glad for all the traditional uh, HEMA enthusiasts who are out there who practice it and read about it and study it and try to bring these old techniques back to life because I love these techniques. But I don't believe in being so traditionalist about it that you think they have to be done exactly as they were back then. I believe in taking the old techniques and reworking them, using different weapons with them, using different techniques and trying to come up with your own techniques and your own style of using them. I believe that each individual warrior is just that, an individual warrior. They have their own style, their own techniques, their own skill sets, their own abilities, so on and so forth. Um, I can do some flourishes with the copies. I'm not going to do any of those fancy reverse flourishes like that, not quickly at least, because I will lose my grip on this thing. And besides, you wouldn't want to do that in a fight anyway. In fact, you wouldn't want to flourish at all in a fight. Unless maybe if you were like coming first into the fight and you just got the weapons in your hand and you did something really simple like that to just kind of warm yourself up, just something really quick and simple to warm yourself up. Even that's a little too fast. I'd probably just, you know, something like that. Something quick. But the thing to note about dual wielding, and I've talked about this before in the video with the cutlass and the bowie, is that one weapon is always going to be used as a parrying weapon. It's always going to be primarily used to guard with. The benefit is so basically that that one weapon is going to use a lot like a buckler. And in general you would use the weapon that is in your offhand for that. You know, um, whichever weapon, like if you've got two weapons of varying lengths, it's usually going to be the shorter weapon that's going to be used for parrying because you want the reach you get with, you get with a longer weapon to strike with. But um, we're talking about using like two short swords here. And as you can tell, the screen stick and the copies are nearly in fact, I think they are actually the exact same length as each other, so they're a pretty decent pair to use for that. Um, 
But in general, basically, what you're going to be using is generally your pairing weapon is going to be the weapon that is in your off hand, your weak hand, your submissive hand, whatever term you want to use for it. In my case, I'm, I'm right handed, so my weak hand is my left hand. That's my off hand. Uh, this is my main hand, or my strong hand, my primary hand, my dominant hand. So I'm going to strike with this, and I'm going to parry with this. But the benefit, as I've talked about before, with using two swords as opposed to a sword and a buckler is that you can hit with the buckler and it can do a lot of damage. But when you're using two swords, or a sword and dagger, or two daggers, or whatever, you've got the ability you don't just parry with one and strike with the other. You can, in the middle of it, reverse and parry with the other and strike. You, know, you can parry with your main hand and strike with your, with your off. You can go from doing this to doing this very quickly and easily. You know, it's the same basic principle. You can do those X blocks I talked about. Things like that. You know, the downward X block I talked about. Um, you can also do things like that and wrap around and strike to the legs. Um, now, as for those are some of the basic ideas. Um, I'm just kind of rambling here. That's all this really is, is just kind of a ramble on my, uh, my opinions on this sort of thing. I do actually advocate flourishing. When you're using a weapon like you got a weapon like this where you can leave the scabbard on it and it maintains its shape and it doesn't throw it off weight too much. You know, or if you've got something like this, like a rattan stick, or any kind of trainer for your short sword that you can train with. I do actually advocate, you know, practicing flourishing techniques. Not in an actual fight. I mean, yes, it is impressive. And if you've got somebody who's never been trained before and you do this stuff really quickly before stepping up into your guard position, you can do some kind of psychological warfare on him, basically. You can make him kind of go, holy shit, this guy knows what he's doing. But in an actual fight, I primarily advise against flourishes. They're a waste of energy. I'm getting tired of just, just doing them. They're a waste of energy. They're a waste of time. They don't actually accomplish anything except they can get you warmed up. You know, they can get your hands used to the weapons, used to the weapons, and they can, uh, to the weight of them, to the feel of them. And uh, they can intimidate your opponent to a certain degree if he's untrained or if he doesn't have the right mindset, if he's, you know, if he's your average mugger or burglar and he's, you know, kind of afraid, he doesn't really want to be there. He doesn't want any trouble. He's just wanting to get in and get out. He wants to get the money and run. You know, you can intimidate him, but if he's there to hurt somebody, and more and more often nowadays you see these home invasions, you know, where the, the people who break in don't just content themselves with controlling the situation, stealing the shit and running. They deliberately go in and hurt people right off the bat. You know, they go in to hurt. They don't just go in to steal. They start off by hurting people. Or they get them in, under control. They have the situation under control. They could just steal the shit and run, but they go ahead and hurt people anyway. They beat them. They kill them. You know, and you do find that a lot of the weapons that are being used are blades or blunt instruments. So I am a firm believer in the fact that, yes, owning a gun could save your life because you never know when one of them might have one. And even if they don't, having one when they don't is a big intimidation factor. All you have to do is point it at them and they'll probably want to run. But I'm also a big proponent in the idea that learning how to fight with melee weapons or an arm against melee weapons is extremely important because you can never guarantee having that gun in the hand. Or you may not have one. Maybe you don't believe in them anymore. That's when something like this comes in. But I do believe in practicing flourishes in a training environment. Because they get you used, especially, again, like I said, it's especially important if you have a weapon like this that you can keep the scabbard on it, go ahead and practice your flourishes with it. You know, Because that gets you accustomed to the weight of the weapon. You can learn it. I've actually owned this as Screamer Stick since I was eight years old. I didn't even know what the hell a Screamer was at the time. I thought this was Japanese. I didn't realize what it was at the time. But because I've owned it since I was eight years old and I've played around with it for all that time, I'm not even watching the stick. I'm watching the camera. I'm just feeling the stick. I can do all that because I've owned the stick for so long and I've played around with it like that all my life. I know the weight of it perfectly. I don't know the weight of this that perfectly, but I do know it okay because it has the scabbard and I feel fairly safe in practicing with it and flourishing. If it didn't have that scabbard, I would probably still play around with it like that, but it'd be a lot slower. It'd be like this. It'd be a lot more mellow. 
because I want to be able to control it. For instance, the cutlass I will never flourish because the hilt, as I've talked about, is horribly shaped. I don't have any control over it. And if I do flourish, and I have flourished Nightshade before, but she's, like I've talked about, Sorry for that interruption. <clears throat> Where was I? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't flourish. Nightshade is a bit longer than what I feel comfortable with in a sword. So I wouldn't be flourishing her that much. But um, but that's another reason why it's important to practice this with a, with a stick. Because I just hit myself in the leg with this one. You did that with a sword blade that was bare. You would hurt yourself badly. Just that one little tap with this would have broken the point in me. So, but um, the dual wielding with Hina, that's an interesting principle because he, especially in the evil terms, which is what I study the most of, because that really doesn't come up that much. You get it in like rapier, and there were some techniques for using two rapiers at once. They weren't common, as I talked about. Um, and of course you have rapier and dagger, which was extremely common. That was pretty much the only way a rapier was ever actually used, was with a dagger in the other hand. But you don't really get it a lot in medieval treatises. In fact, I've never read anything before that actually demonstrates dual wielding of swords. But the techniques can be applied to an extent, you know, especially if you mix them a little bit with some like um, Kali Eskrima techniques and stuff, which to be honest, there are actually a lot of similarities between some of the Kali Eskrima techniques and some of the um, like Messer techniques and Falchion techniques and Armin Sword techniques. So there's not, I think the biggest difference is in how they train. Kali is extremely ritualized, it's extremely advanced, like it's extremely flourishing and fancy in its training, whereas Hema is a lot more direct, straightforward, simple, and to the point. It's all about hurting or killing your opponent very quickly and easily. Um, <clears throat> So, anyway. Human techniques with dual wheel. Let's see if I can come up with a few here. Um, one of those common techniques for using a short sword is the arm trap, which is actually part of grappling. It's basically where, without the sword, you would, without a secondary, when you block the attack, and then you would wrap your opponent's arm into yours. You would had that parry there, and you would come up and over his weapon and trap him into your arm with a tight thing. Probably try to grab his hand or the sword or something like that to hold it in place to keep him from pulling or pushing it. And then you would bring this one down for the attack. How can we translate this into using two weapons? Well, we can go for one of those Xbox, but we need them to the side. So it's like this, and then we could wrap this weapon around, and we can actually threaten with it. We'll bring this one around to do the finishing blow, or to simply keep it in a threatening position. Um, let's see, what else? Um, from that same position, we could push this to the side and then wrap his arm with this. You know, basically, so his, his arm, his weapon needs pushed down like this. And then we would go from there and we would wrap this sword under and around his arm while trapping his weapon under here and push this against the back of his head or shoulder or something like that, or even twist it around and push it up against the side of his head. And then you get this weapon back here, which could be another copies or a gladius or something like that, or whatever your secondary sword is that we could use for a thrust to the back, or cut, or chop. Or even keeping this weapon down here, we could do the same thing to the head up here. Um, you got all kinds of really quick little motions that you can make. Dual wielding, like most martial arts, I think that Dual wielding is highly instinctive. It's you know, get the weapons in your hand and start playing with them and come up with your own ideas. You know, visualize in your mind. If you don't have a sparring partner, visualize in your mind the attack that you want to see coming, and then visualize how you would see dealing with it. Like another thing you can do, again, you have two weapons is you can use one to bind and control your opponent's weapon and still strike with the other. So you know, say your opponent comes in with a with a zorn how over the right shoulder like this coming down at you, you can block with both. And then you use this one to bind, or you reach down with this one and you step under, you know, using this weapon to keep his up above you and keep it under control, and slash him across the stomach with this weapon. You know, 
will step around to the back and hamstring across the back of the thigh. And of course you've got you know, both weapons at once, but again, if you use both weapons at once to attack, you're not controlling his weapon. So even if you get a kill on him, he could run his weapon around and hit you, and it, it could conceivably kill you. You could kill each other. So you always want to keep that up your opponent's weapon under control. Now, there's one area where dual wielding is very useful. One of the most famous people to ever come up with a dual wielding technique that didn't employ swords, although it employed a long sword and a short sword, although by European standards, the long sword was actually really short, was Miyamoto Musashi who is, to this day, recognized as being the most famous swordsman in Japan. And he created his own style, um, uh, Nitanichi Ryu, I think it was called, that, um, please correct me if I pronounce that wrong, that employed the katana, the long sword in the right hand, being used one-handed, which was extremely against the rules at that time, and a kodachi or wakazashi, a short sword basically, in the left hand. But the one thing that we see is that that kodachi in the left hand is pretty much primarily used as a parrying weapon. In fact, one of the techniques I did was the bowling knife in the, kata, in the cutlass is actually still taught in his reel of kenjutsu to this day, and that's to parry an upward strike with it, and at the same time cut low to the left. And you're basically standing like this, your opponent makes one of those uppercuts, and you just step in and you block with this weapon and cut with that one. So you see that same principle. Um, another principle that he taught was if you stand like this, you threaten your opponent with this weapon, and he wants to clear it aside so that he can open you up to attack. Now you hold this right, he kind of almost forgets that it's there. He can't really see it anymore, so he kind of forgets that it's there. He sees this one though, it's pointing right at his face like that. So he sees it, and he wants to get it out of the way so that he can open you up and get at you. So he, his first attack is going to be to try to knock that aside so he can get in. Of course, this works especially when you're up against someone who's using a weapon in two hands. Like, for instance, a mugger might use a shovel or a baseball bat or something like that. So when he swings at it, you just move with it. You don't try to resist at all. In fact, if you can, you just drop the weapon out of the way and you just let his weapon go, go through. And the force that he applied to it, it's expecting to meet, he's expecting to meet resistance. So he's putting a lot of force into it to knock it aside. When he meets no resistance, that force lets him carry through like this, which exposes him. So basically, the minute you clear this and he flies through, you just step in and you cut with this, or you thrust with it. Um, basically, there are principles like that when you use Perhaps you're parrying with them. You use one weapon or the other in front to sort of draw your opponent's attention. Maybe you're moving it like this while you keep the other one down behind your back. This is a really good trick to use with the left hand weapon because most people are right handed. So if they see a weapon in your right hand and they don't see your left hand at all, they might assume that this is your only weapon, especially if you keep it in motion and you keep it out towards them, you keep their attention on it. They close in, they try to do something to that weapon. Perhaps they even, you know, you just leave it hanging out there and they try to grab it or push it aside, and then you just come over with this weapon, or they push it aside, and you just step in with that weapon to cut or to thrust. As another point I want to make, the thrust is in general more lethal than the cut. The cut is more impressive and more likely to make them run. But unless you get a major artery or then or a soft spot with the stomach and they're not wearing too many layers of clothing, you're not going to get a lethal blow. But a thrust, even if they're wearing a lot of clothing, a thrust is more likely to penetrate deep. And once you get in there, you can twist the blade around, and instead of just pulling it straight out, you can rip it out, and you'll slash them open deep internally, and they will, that's a more guaranteed kill. Um, but basically, most techniques with short swords are all around using just one, because especially in Kuna, because a lot of the techniques were all in an open hand to grapple with, you know, like this technique. You know, or, um, for instance, there's this technique where you grab and push on the other one. You can even wrap the sword under their arm and over and use the pommel on the inside of their wrist to kind of lock it and you push against their elbow. And then you can just slash them across the throat. You can't have to do that with two weapons. 
It's a little more tricky, but you basically catch and push it aside and you wrap this one, and then you just, you can even reverse this one real quick and push it against the back of his arm and cut across the throat. Or reach around and stab with this one, or stab him in the back, where you're using this weapon wrapped around his arm to control him. But the trick there is that you need a weapon. This one probably wouldn't actually do it because the stuff is too slick and it's rounded right here, so you couldn't really catch the wrist unless you literally press your wrist against the back of theirs and folded it in so that you kind of pinch it between your wrist and the pommel. And even then, you could just slip it out. For that, you really need something more like this, where it's got a sharper ridge, a sharper design, and a sharper ridge there where you can just pinch it straight in and just push down on that thing to really keep that wrist trapped. But um, dual wielding is an interesting concept, and I'll uh, probably do more on it later. This is, um, yeah, this is the this thing I'm going to return to later because it does, it does deserve more talk and about it. And I'll probably also do some uh, videos discussing general self defense techniques and some arm techniques, and uh, of course, single step or single sword techniques. But um, for now, this is all. So, hope you enjoyed that, and I'll, uh, I'll see you all in the next video.